Well, on Rebuilders today, we are continuing our mini series, The Opening Door to Renewal. What are we focusing on today, Mark? We are getting our fingernails into the issue of non discipleship, uh, the idea of cultural Christianity, nominal Christianity, and asking the question is there actually an underlying worldview? that exists underneath this, that needs to be explored, how that changes things. Uh, and we're also going to look at augmented reality Ooh. and uh, what that means for us in leading and what if your church has become a floating signifier. Ooh, ah, many uh, tantalizing little clues there. Mm. So if you would like to know more about the things that we reference in this episode, you can subscribe to our mailing list by heading to rebuilders.co and subscribing there. Let's go for it. Roger. Roger and out. Hi, welcome to Rebuilders. My name's Liddy and I'm here with Mark and Daniel. How are you both? Good. Fantastic. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Great. Can I begin by rumor mongering? Oh, monger away. Uh, I heard a rumor hot on the street. Which street? <laughs> my my street. Yes, and it what? Well, yes, you know, we've had a few hot days. days. Yes. Kangaroos as well. Was well, this not a kangaroo related? I mean, street. My street has been. We've moved from pastries to my street, but um, <laughs> no, so the hot co- topic of the rebuilders podcast. Mechanism. Yeah, coping next is. Well, we've got freedom now, so we can run down the streets. <laughs> um, so on the weekend. Uh, 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 my co-host, that's you, Liddy, oh, yes, um, for the audience at home, uh, went uh, with my wife uh, and my children yes. to the beach. I did. It um, was a great day. I, I protested um, yeah. by staying home <laughs> in a silent <laughs> protest. <laughs> um, which I, Mark I, hates sand. Yeah, I protested by watching TV in the air conditioning. You rebel. <laughs> yeah, I'm, an, I'm a revolutionary from way back. Uh, <laughs> I'm leading a revolution from my couch. Um <laughs> And uh, the rumour, the hot rumour on my street, which I have not spoken to you about, but uh, was <laughs> that uh, one of my neighbours came across, my <laughs> wife was driving, you were in the front seat, and one of my neighbours came across and mistook you for my 14-year-old daughter <laughs> yeah. asking you how high school was going. <laughs> yeah, uh, look, he it did. Going? <laughs> yeah. It's going really well. Um, mm. I have finished high school. I went back to high school as a teacher yeah. and then have also left high school again. That's a pretty so, good, like you've gone from being in high school to being a high school teacher and now people think that you're back in high school again. It's like 21 Jump Street. <laughs> I've not seen it. I reckon I watched the first 10 minutes of that. Okay, it's not a movie. It's a to a to you youngins. It's 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 a movie. It's not a TV remake. Wasn't there some rubbish remake? Yeah, oh, I had um Channing Tatum. Channing Tatum. Movie. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen Johnny the TV Depp. show. Johnny Depp was in the original. Yeah, he's been cancelled, Mark. Uh, well, he was he was eaten a bit when I was young. <laughs> I know he's been cancelled now, but you know memories. <laughs> yeah. Don't don't, don't <laughs> cancel my memories. Okay, well I won't. Anyway. Um. Yes. Well, just so you know, your neighbour was set straight, although I don't think he really understood what was going on. No, that's that's. So fine. I think it's probably less that I am youthful looking, although thanks, um, and probably more that he couldn't see who was in the front seat. Don't make excuses for your youthfulness. <laughs> <laughs> Righto. All right. Okay, let's get into it. So last week we started... The mini series, The Opening Door to Renewal, and we're going to continue that today, um, talking about uncovering hidden practical theologies. Yeah. So, yeah, let's, how about start by giving us a bit of a framework as to what a practical theology is or what it, what it means. So, we're in the midst of a series called The Opening Door to Renewal. Yeah. And- we looked at last week how renewal, according to Dallas Willard, is actually, uh, or awakenings and revivals, are uh, when people rediscover discipleship. Yeah. Following Jesus with the whole of their lives. And we talked about last week that one of the big problems in the sort of Western contemporary church is that in many ways that vision has been lost mm-hmm. and that many churches that many of us would, um, not everyone is listening, but you know, many of us would um, be part of, actually came out of this tradition of challenging people who were in, uh, let's call them mainline or established churches to enter into a kind of renewal awakening through giving the whole of their lives to God and being fully obedient. But that what had happened is that something had shifted and that over the last few decades, particularly since World War II, Willard argued that um, non-obedience, non-discipleship had become normative in many churches where being born again was more about believing 
a few set of doctrine, um, whether that or not that transformed your life. And uh, that's a summary of last week, but really wanted to talk about uh, this week, the idea that if we're going to really grapple with this, mm-hmm. um, and if we're going to really grapple with the implications of what uh, is getting past this barrier yeah. of doing ministry with often where a majority of the, the uh, congregation is stuck in this position of, of non-obedience, uh, cultural Christianity, you know, h- how do you exist in this place? And so to do that, I think it's really helpful to, uh, or how do you not exist in this place? How do you, you know, have a flourishing ministry, which leads people towards discipleship in such an environment? Yeah. To, to do this, I think, and this is what we really want to dig in today. Um, Will I'd also talked about something else, which I think is a really key concept in his book, The Spirit of the Disciplines, which is understanding that everyone operates from a practical theology. Now, what does he mean by that? Firstly, to understand that, we have to understand that one of the myths that we've had is that there are people who are serious about theology and discipleship, and then everyone else is doing their thing. Mm-hmm. They're just living their life. And that there's the people who are serious about their faith and they have a theology, they have a doctrine, they've got a dogma which is driving them and they're living out these values in, in this sort of, you know, key, directed, discipled way. And Will had argued that everyone is discipled. Yeah. Um, and he's got a great quote. He says this, he says, everyone has a practical theology, even if it's only the purely negative one of the atheist. And everyone's practical theology vitally affects the course of his or her life. A thoughtless or uninformed theology grips and guides our life with just as great a force as does a thoughtful and informed one. Hmm. And so I think one of the great myths of post-Christianian secularism is that theology is irrelevant. People don't have a practical theology. But Willard's arguing a very different point that we need to get to grips with here, that everyone has a practical theology whether they know it or not. So we're all operating out of a particular belief system. Hmm. Whether we know it or not. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So our thoughts and our actions are based on something. They're coming from somewhere. Yeah. Yes. Just because you're not a Christian doesn't mean you don't have them. Exactly. Okay. So what are our un- unexamined practical theologies? Okay. So if, if you look at the, the contemporary world, there would be many unexamined practical theologies that people are living from. Mm. If you even think of your friends, you go, oh, that person's sort of living from that life script. That person just wants to live for the weekend. That person's defined by their work. You know, so many different things. Um, this person's into wellness. This person's, you know, is a rationalist. But underneath all of them, I was trying to think, like, what, what's sort of almost a, a root belief that's underneath all of them? And I want to argue that one of the great beliefs um, that took hold in the West is something that I've called the secular Sabbath. Okay. The secular Sabbath. So it's almost a meta theology. And I think mm-hmm. it's one of our great hidden practical theologies that is unexamined by people, but hugely powerful. Now, to understand what I mean by this, often when we think of Sabbath, we tend to think of taking a Sunday off, taking a Saturday off. Mm. Um, yep. You know, there's been, um, you know, a real re interest in, is that a word? Re interest? Oh, look, we'll go with it. A. Renewed interest yes, in, 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 in the idea of Sabbath yeah. and some and some books written on that and um, you know people talking about that. Mm. Um, but if you look at the idea of a Sabbath, it's interesting. We often think of it as a rest from work. Now that is a hundred percent part of it. Um, but I just want to read from um, Gregory's Gregory Bill, the theologian's uh, book, New Testament Theology, and he's talking about um, uh, Adam in the Garden mm-hmm. and Genesis. And he gets to the heart here of what Sabbath or rest is. Um, So he says this, Just as God had achieved heavenly rest after overcoming creational chaos and constructing the beginning of his creational temple, creational temple being the world. So notice there's two things here. Number one is he's constructing the world. Yes. So we have to do that as work. But then there's another element, overcoming chaos. Uh, So I'll continue with the quote. So, Adam presumably would achieve unending rest after overcoming the opposition of the serpent and the opposing temptation to sin and extending the boundaries of the glorious Eden temple around the entire earth. Now, this also finds an important analogy later with David, who cannot build the temple because he, because although he has achieved rest by overcoming outside enemies, there were still internal forces of opposition that were suppressed only after his death. Thus Solomon built the temple because all enemies, both outside and within Israel, had been conquered for a period. 
At this time, God is said to have found rest in the holiest of holies in the temple because all his earthly enemies, who were also Israel's enemies, had been defeated. The ancient Near East also reflects the same pattern of overcoming opposition resulting in rest, which is indicated by the building of a temple. So the idea is that Sabbath, rest, is connected to, yes, resting from work, Mm -hmm. but overcoming enemies. And once you've overcome your enemies externally and internally, then you can rest and then you live in this temple space. Mm. Now, in many ways, if you think about our world and you think about the ideology of our world, particularly in the end of the 20th century and into the 21st century, if you think about how we see the world, I think there's a real analogy here. The idea, which was spoken about a lot on this podcast, is that this idea came about that the sort of Western developed world, uh, particularly after the fall of communism, had mm-hmm. defeated external enemies. Yeah, okay. The um, you know, fall of the Berlin Wall, there was this high point, this triumphant moment, and the world was transformed from this place with enemies into yes. a playground. Yeah, yeah. Where you can travel and you can see the world as this great canvas to paint the story of your life upon. Mm -hmm. And so all of your internal things that you wish for, your hunger, your lack of um, access to the good life, that was overcome. It was this new age where we had the connection to more opportunities, more pleasures, more things to buy, and the world was coming together and moving towards this wonderful, wonderful place. So it's this idea that of the world, if you, if you see that what the world became, the ideology of the world, it was a secularized version of that Genesis vision of God overcoming enemies external and internal. Yes. And a temple built for God's flourishing, our flourishing. But in this vision, humans replace God. Yes. And humans, not only humans, it's really the, the West or the developed world. Uh-huh. And the West and the developed world has overcome all its external enemies. And the world is now this place where you can flourish and we can rest and we can have this Sabbath. So it's a secularized version of the day of the Lord. Um, And so therefore, the vision then, had what sort of practical theology does that say to people? It says, well, Mm. the world is your playground. Go forth and, you know, multiply a catalog of wonderful experiences. And Um, post them all on Instagram. Exactly. And... uh, a new, this creates a new type of intensified individualism, which is tied to this reimagining uh, of our environment. That's the sort of basis, the meta theory uh, of, I think, the biggest practical theology that's been probably at play in the last few decades for us. Okay. Well, can you describe maybe in more detail this intensified individualism? Yeah. Um, how is how is it actually a, a practical theology that people are living from? So I just want to break it down into three key elements. Mm-hmm. Um, so first of all is that it's a therapeutic individualism. Therape- therapeutic comes from the word of feelings. So basically the practical theology, this practical theology is based upon the belief that human flourishing is a found in accumulating as many good feelings as possible. If the external enemies have been defeated, if the internal enemies have been defeated, you're free to just enjoy life. Yeah. To, if the world's your playground, go forth and multiply good feelings in yourself. That is the highest. If, God, if, if humanity's replaced God, the highest we can wish for then is to accumulate good feelings. The second one hmm. is experiential individualism. So that's in a sense like the mode of doing that. So the practical theology here is based on the belief that human flourishing is found in accumulating as many positive experiences as possible. So if you want the good feelings, you've got to have lots of good experiences. Yes, okay. The third element is consumerist individualism. That's the practical theology that's based on the belief that human flourishing is found in accumulating high value possessions. So good feelings, good experiences, good possessions. Well, that all sounds really great though. (laughs) Um, Maybe not. How has it affected the church? Okay, so this is where it gets really interesting. So if that's how we understand the environment of the world, Mm If the practical theology is that the world is there and the external and internal enemies have been conquered and already I can think some people saying, hang on, but is that true? We'll get to that. Um, uh, That it's a re-understanding, a repainting over the human environment, the world. And Mm -hmm. if you think about back to that Bill quote, he talks about that the world was created as a creational temple. Yes. And a creational temple is created to house the presence of God. Right. Okay, so we then have a world without the presence of God. Yep. And naturally, because if that's this sort of uh, practical theology of the world, if that's the dominant ideology, it's inevitable that will begin to 
affect the architectural structure of our churches. And we can look at that in a really practical bricks and mortar sense. Yeah. So if you think about a lot of contemporary churches, you know, we had this move where we got rid of got rid of windows. They almost became enclosed in spaces. And it was this enclosed in space where which was facilitated for having an experience. If you think of cathedrals, you know, in the middle medieval periods, it was sort of used as these teaching tools. There was lots of um, they were multimedia devices, yes. the, 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 the cathedral with stained glass windows and uh, sculptures. Yeah, and, iconography. And, and, and even the structure was like a cross and your yeah. eyes went upwards and it was sort of this transcendent space. Interestingly, sort of these churches, it's almost an imminent internal space of mm. like to enter into worship, to to enter into this place, you know, it's well sound, uh, yeah. good for projections uh, on, on the back of the screen. Um, so in a sense, what happened was that many churches at a physical level unintentionally became sort of like architectural spaces uh, in which, you know, it was still sort of to help you have good feelings yes, to okay. a place where you would have those experiences and in some ways sort of offering through programs and so on sort of religious consumerist um, things, yeah. um, all of which were add-ons to the individualist life script that you're already living Wow. A little bit like a booster th- booster rocket theology where the space shuttle got into orbit through a booster rocket, but once it got into the orbit it wanted, it discarded the booster rocket. So faith becomes the booster rocket to get you into your into your orbit. Mm. And in many ways um, also what happened though was the mental image of the church changed. Now there's some people listening going, okay, that's I know those churches that are like that. My church is not like that. My yeah. church didn't change physically bricks and mortar. But what happened, and this is where people miss out, there's a two-way street here. This is not just, in an individualist world, it's not just the command and control structures at the centre of the culture which is determining everything, say perhaps in the medieval church where the the central authorities of the church were determining you know, the story of reality. In individualism, the individual is determining the story of reality. And so mm-hmm. what happens then is that in many ways uh, that that people begin to mentally change the architecture of the church themselves, whether the architecture of that church has changed or not. But how? How can the <laughs> mental architecture of a church be unintentionally changed? Okay. So one of the questions that many people are asking is, with the rise of the metaverse, and we talked about the metaverse in this in this podcast, and particularly, I think it it gained, uh, you know, notoriety with um, Facebook rebrand branding as Meta and their mm. big launch around that. Yeah. So you got people asking questions, you know, like should my church be in virtual reality? Should my church be in the metaverse? And more and more, I've thought about it. I think the answer to that is before we even get to there is the realization is you're already in it, mate. You've actually been living in a metaverse for ten years. <laughs> And that actually what has happened is that as intensified individualism has spread throughout the world and that's been married with this new digital reality is what that means is we can reinterpret spaces as we want to see them. We can reinterpret we, you know, like if, if what happens is a space then, if, if the values of the society is the world is your playground, you can self-create, the world is what you want to make it, external and internal enemies have been defeated, you can then repurpose and refashion in your mind any space that you want to. So mm-hmm. what that means is you can have a church where they're trying to achieve everything we're talking about here, take the church into a renewal, take the church into, you know, discipleship, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the people coming in, even without necessarily a technological device, because our brains have been reprogrammed by this deep Mm -hmm. ideology of the secular Sabbath, is that we're repurposing it in our mind as a space which is going to serve our needs. This is not just true of the church, it's true of so many things. Mm. So the environment then becomes almost like a raw material for the individual to use in their process of self-transformation, self-creation. Yes, with this ideology operating underneath. I remember being in New York, walking down some street somewhere, pretty nondescript street, and um, I'm just walking, going to a meeting or something, and there's just people all around me taking photos. You know, So bore- it's like 10 o'clock in the morning, boring, pretty nondescript street in Manhattan, and yet people are taking all these photos. And what they're doing is they're recreating that raw material yes. of New York. New York is a real living city with people who've lived there their whole lives with interesting bits, boring bits, beautiful bits, ugly bits, like every city in the world. Mm. 
But the photos that they're taking is what they're extracting is this New York experience. Yes. Um, it can be the same in Melbourne here. You know, Melbourne, it's interesting. Um, I was listening to Spotify on the way here and there was an ad came up and it was like, Melbourne's all about FOMO. There are so many things happening in Melbourne. It was just like this <laughs> ad of like how awesome Melbourne is and all this stuff happening. And, you know, I thought like I was in I was in the central business district of our city on the weekend and so much stuff is shut. It's a ghost town after the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. And what I realized what this ad is doing is it's encouraging people to go back into town, access experiences to have good feelings, take the raw materials of the bricks and mortar of Melbourne and transform it back into what it was, yes. this space which yes. we had all these different meanings written over it. So what that means is that the world is our raw material. However, we then have to keep intensifying this process mm. to maintain the illusion of the secular Sabbath because – if the highest value of our culture is that actually it's all about having good feelings, mm -hmm. it becomes harder to actually hold that together when we don't have good feelings. Yeah. So there's this cognitive dissonance that's breaking into the world. And I think we'll talk about this in the next episode, but what's happened is there's been all these shocks where that story that you live in a secular Sabbath, it, it's being broken apart. As we yeah. you know, report it, as we're recording this, you know, the world is sort of waiting with bated breath. Will Russia invade Ukraine? Uh, we've had coronavirus. There's environmental challenges. There's all these things that happen in the world. Yes. And that that ideology is teetering of the secular Sabbath. So the more that happens, the more we want to push into good feelings. But people keep saying, if I'm what, you know, I've been told that the most important thing is to have good feelings, but I feel so rubbish and anxious about my life. We also see people who are trying to find deeper stories of meaning that are beyond mm. just the augmentation of experiences and feelings. They're looking for something deeper. And so what that means is an augmented reality space in our world actually is becoming an increasingly more toxic, toxic and emotionally uh, contested space. And, well, as, as leaders, it does affect us, but how? Like how can – how do we respond to it? How do we see how it's affecting us? Yeah. So the sort of anthropologist um, Levi Strauss, Claude Levi Strauss, talked about this idea of a floating signifier. Mm -hmm. A floating signifier is a symbol that is almost emptied of meaning yeah. That I may see this cup and it means something to me and it means something completely different to you. Yes. It's emptied of meaning. Yeah. And, you know, he talked about how increasingly that that was going to become more and more true of contemporary society. Mm. And so in this world where individuals have seen the world as this neutral space, a playground which you can self-create in, everything's up for grabs. Everything's, everything is what you want to make it. Mm. Um, and... Basically, what that means is our churches have become this thing which people come in and often despite our programs, they're interpreting all that through their own lenses and church has become a floating signifier. Yes. But I think that the starting point is there has to be a push back against this. What is happening? What ultimately cultural Christianity is, what nominal Christianity is, what non-obedience is of people coming to churches uh, attending churches who are not intent on giving the whole of their lives to Jesus is that what is happening is they're using the church as a floating signifier. They are using the church to advance what they see as the goals of this life project as promised to them by mm. the ideology of our age. Now, at the center of that is that I think so many people listening to this feel a sense that actually they themselves as leaders, as pastors, as ministers have become floating signifiers. Mm -hmm. You have people mm -hmm. writing all kinds of meaning all over you. To one person, you're this source of frustration. To another, you're the one who's going to save them and help them finally have good feelings. Uh, to some people, you're too liberal. To others, you're too conservative. To some people, you're too pushing into changing church. You're not. You're letting it change too much. Uh, to some, you should be following this political program. To others, you should be resisting that political program. And I think a lot of what people are going through at the moment is we're caught in this battlefield, a battlefield of meaning, mm. yet no one's named that because the great ideology of our age is falling down. And that can bring up a whole bunch of stuff in us. 
we, if we are also raised in this great ideology of this great secular Sabbath where we have defeated the external and internal enemies and we should have this wonderful life with a catalogue of good experiences, you may wonder why you're not having a catalogue of good experiences. Part of the answers that's been given is to go deeper into yourself in a Christian way of finding all the different Christian pro personality profiles that you can find. Yeah. But it's almost like the more we understand about ourselves, the more we have to distance from the world because the world is becoming this increasingly fractious and fragmented place. And so there's this sense that as an augmented reality becomes an increasingly more emotionally toxic place, there has to be a stopping point. There has to be a sort of resistance that comes from leaders. So I, I imagine that there are many leaders who are recognising what you're talking about in themselves um, and maybe seeing that they've become this way. Uh, what's the way out? I think the way out is through a really simple statement. Okay. The simple statement, I think the beginning of what will be a program of reinstigating the true call of Jesus to go into all the mm -hmm. world, make disciples, begins with leaders realizing that you're not a floating signifier. You are not this person who has been tasked with delivering good feelings to people. You are not a leader who is there to simply deliver the wants and needs of congregations of people who don't mm. fully want to follow with the whole of their lives, who are actually living out an alternate ideology. You are not a floating signifier. <laughs> You're not an empty meme to be interpreted. There is this great story. We've talked a lot about Mike Goheen's book about the theology of Leslie Newbigin. And in that, he talks about spending time. Mike Goheen talks about spending time with Newbigin. They were going to go and speak somewhere. And Mike was really nervous, he describes in the book, about how this audience, uh, who a lot of them were more theologically liberal than Newbigin and Mike was, and Mike was nervous. Yeah. And he was heading into this, this uh, meeting and um, – Basically, he expressed his his worry from memory for the story to to Newbegin, and Newbegin essentially, I think he took his hand and then sort of dropped his hand, and he said he said essentially, I'm paraphrasing, he said, "My job is to simply preach the gospel, deliver God's message. Mm. My responsibility is not how they respond." Essentially, mm. is what he's saying, and I feel this sense that. A lot of people, because of the ideological structure of this day, yeah. have this sense that it's actually their responsibility to, to deliver all these false expectations that mm. people have. Who are you? You are called by God. If you're listeners and you're a leader and you're in ministry, you are called by God. You are called to preach his gospel. You are called to announce his kingdom. You are called to be obedient. That's actually the starting point. That's the beginning point. Those who want to follow you in those things are the ones who are going to follow you in those things. You begin a remnant by actually setting a core around the message of Jesus Christ. Mm. That is reality. And what's really interesting is Jesus, we have some elements of his story when he was born. We yep. have some him going to the temple as a young boy. Mm -hmm. We have nothing for almost 30 years until he emerges into ministry. Mm. Those years, he lived a completely sinless life, a kingdom life. He was growing in stature and favor with God that whole time. And that whole time, that was done in the most ordinary of reality. Mm. And so that is happening when, when you live and follow and obey God in reality. That is the answer to a world which doesn't want to face reality that is augmenting reality we actually meet god in reality and, mm. the, and the lie that we've been sold is that to be a great christian leader you've got to be someone who's doing all these amazing experiential wonderful high point things no it's actually living by the spirit in the most ordinary places when you're exhausted um, at the end of a day when you're dealing with loneliness when you're busy and running kids around when you're facing disappointment it's actually in those spaces uh, that you make this stand against this false ideology of the world. The world is not this place where we've actually defeated the external and internal enemies and the world's your playground. The world is created by God 
God created human beings to go into the world and to cultivate that, to fight against the creational disorder mm. um, with God. And so that's the task before us. And so I think that beginning step for us is to first say, no, we're not going to continue in this way of, of saying, yes, this is the ideology. We're not going to be a floating signifier. This is the gospel. This is the kingdom. I'm going this direction. Are you coming? Great. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm not going to add to it. Let's leave it there. We'll see you next week.